My name is William Cooper. I'm standing on Highway 375 in Nevada, about 140 miles north-northwest of Las Vegas. The mountain that I'm standing on is known as Hancock Mountain, and we are at Hancock Summit. Few people who travel this road, if any, ever realize that off in the distance over those mountains is one of the most closely guarded secrets in the history of the world. And that secret is the subject of this videotape. We are standing now in the Tickaboo Valley at the foot of Hancock Summit. across the valley, approximately in the center, is a ranch owned by Steve Medlin. This is a cattle ranch, but it is also one of the first lines of security for a super secret test site known as Area 51. On maps, when you can find it on maps, it is labeled Groom Dry Lake. Until recent years, this area was so desolate that few people ever bothered to venture into it. And also until recent years, there were no small towns anywhere near this area. Appearances are deceptive. This film was made in January. In the daytime it's chilly, usually requires that you wear some kind of a light jacket and sometimes a heavy jacket. But at night time, temperatures drop well below freezing. During the two week period that we filmed this documentary, we were only able to really use our cameras on two nights because on all of the other nights, our equipment froze up and was literally useless. If you should venture into this area in the winter time, make sure you bring plenty of warm clothing and emergency equipment should you break down at night. There is nothing out here except cactus, Joshua trees, tumbleweeds, snakes, lizards, a few birds, cattle scattered everywhere. No one is ever able to come into the Tickaboo Valley are in fact anywhere near the test site from any direction without being detected and monitored for the entire time that they are in the area.
security is scattered throughout the valley. They belong to a corporation called Wackenhut Corporation and work at the test site on a contract basis. They can usually be found driving four-wheel drive vehicles and will approach anyone who ventures off of Highway 375 toward the direction of the test site. Another one of the observation posts in the valley is located on top of this snow-capped mountain. If you look carefully at the very highest peak, you can see the observation tower. Also, if you notice, coming from the left side of your screen, you can see one of the black helicopters that patrols the entire area on a random basis. From this observation point at the top of the mountain, they can see everything and everyone for a radius of 80 miles. Panning out from the Steve Medlin Ranch, you will notice that we are standing at the junction of the dirt road that goes into the test site and Highway 375. The te this road actually approaches the test site from the north, and the actual test site is about 45 degrees to the left of the road and over the mountain. Most of Nevada can be classified as open range. Open range, for those of you who have never heard the term before, means that there are few, if any, fences and cattle roam freely. You must be extremely careful when driving at night and during the daytime because cattle can frequently be found standing directly in the center of the highway. This is the area known as the 29 and a half mile marker, although there is no actual 29 and a half mile marker. But this is approximately halfway between the 30 mile marker and the 29 mile marker. This is the famous mailbox on the side of Highway 375 in the Mojave Desert in the state of Nevada. From this point, tens of thousands of people have watched strange craft fly in the sky over Area 51. This is the small town of Rachel. It hasn't been here for very long. Most of the people who live here work for the government or for the test site in some way or other. The entire town is made up of mobile homes, RVs, and camping trailers, and there are really only about two or three permanent buildings. This dirt road eventually links up with another one that is another entrance to the test site. This is the Little Alien, owned by Pat and Joe Travis. We're going to interview Joe Travis in just a few moments. At the time of this interview, there was quite a bit of machinery in operation, and because I had a very limited time, was not able to wait until they shut the machinery off. So make sure that you listen carefully, because Joe has a lot to say. We've been here one on four years, be four years in August. And it's been an experience. Uh, all the beautiful people we've met, things that we've learned about uh, UFOs and such. It's, it's been, a, been a fantastic experience. Something that a lot of people don't get to experience. We have rooms available. How many rooms, Joe? We have eight rooms. 
There's, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four. Four of the rooms have double, have two beds in them. Have you ever uh, seen any UFOs yourself? Oh, it was the first winter we were here. At that time, it was the bar was called the Rachel Bar and Grill. First winter, it was very cold outside, and my wife and I were the only ones in the bar. And we were sitting about the middle of the bar, I'd say. And like, uh, suddenly a beam of light came through the rear door. Just, uh, well, I'm my best describe it, probably like a flashlight going through a, an opening. Just the light was there and then suddenly it was gone. So my wife and I looked at each other and says, uh, I said, uh, did you see what I think I saw? She said, yes, I did. And uh, it was like that I felt a presence. Uh, I don't know how else to describe it. I felt that something or some kind of energy was there. Uh, that's the only way I could explain it. So I said, uh, oh, come on in. You're welcome. Make yourself at home. Was the door open, Joe? No, the door was closed. It was, like I say, it was very cold outside. It was probably 20 below zero. So this light was actually coming right through the door? It came right through the door. Just just, just an instant right through the door. And the, 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 like I said, the jam, like like a flashlight goes through a door, you know, it light up the jam. And then it, it just disappeared. And we never saw anything leave. Whatever energy it was, uh, it just came and it, it, uh, we didn't see it leave. Never. Do you think there's really some, some UFO type craft out here in the test site, Joe? Oh, there's no doubt about it. In my mind, uh, just, well, just too many people have reported it, and uh, too many people have seen them, and too many people have photographs, so it's just not, uh, it's not someone's imagination. There is something definitely out there. That's my opinion, of course. You know. It's really nice to have you back again, Bill, and be able to visit with you again. We, uh, as you know, and maybe our friends out there don't, we've been here for three and a half years. It's almost four years. It's a little place out in, well, we kind of call it the hub. Everything goes on around us, at least 100 miles around. And uh, we have a little bar and a little restaurant and a little motel. When we took this place over three and a half years ago, it was a lot smaller than it is now. and It was kind of a big struggle for us. We did a lot of remodeling, we've done a lot of menu changes and taken over a failed business and make it succeed. With a lot of people's help, the local people, people just like you that come to see us and see what everything's all about up here. It was. A few months after we were open, when a man came in here late one night and told us that he had heard about our little place on the radio. Well, needless to say, there was no way this man could have heard about us on the radio. We're out in the middle of nowhere. We're just way too small and financially not strong enough at all to get and pay for any radio time. That, I mean, what's this man want? That's what we said that night. As it ended up, we talked a little bit. Sure enough, it wasn't very long before Billy Goodman called us on the radio and we found out it was a fact he had been talking about our little place. Well, the fun, the good people, the good food, the we just have a good time up here. And the UFO activity that had been going on around our area, we have since then kind of become an information exchange center. And the people that come here are just from every realm of life. We have had people here from every place in the United States and around the world. We have a lot of tourists that come here traveling back and forth. We have a lot of people that are searching information on UFOs and things that Joe and I have seen or not seen or other people that have seen these things. It was a while back, well, probably two years. It was either in January or late December or January. 
two years ago. And up here where we are in Rachel, it gets very cold. And that particular time, it was well below zeros. Joe and I were alone that night sitting in the bar. It was about 8 o'clock at night. I'm going to say between 8 and 9 because neither one of us are really sure. And through the middle of our back door came a beam of light. Now, when it's well below zero, and it was probably 25 below, those doors are solidly shut, and it's a steel-clad door. We looked at each other and said, did you see what I think I saw? And we both agreed exactly what had happened, that something or some form had come into our place. Well, we had occasionally told just out in the general, you know, if they want to come and visit, that would be great. We would love to have a being. And that's what we felt that it was. We both felt a presence of something. We never saw a shape or a form of any kind. But we just told whatever it was to make itself at home. If it could come through the steel door, it could certainly open a can of beer or a soda pop or go fix a sandwich. So we just sat and went back to what we were doing. I hear a rumble off in the distance. What is that, Joe? Those are airplanes. Uh, the fighter range is just over there a ways. They're on a. They're having an exercise right now, a training exercise. We, we get an air show just practically every day. You know, we can uh, see the dog fights and watch them drop, drop their magnesium flares. And it's uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, just an experience living here. As a matter of fact, uh, I came from Michigan in 1979 to Las Vegas. And uh, <laughs> I always tell everyone, if you wear out a pair of shoes in Nevada, well, you'll always live in Nevada. You'll always be back. You might leave, but you'll come back. <laughs> I think uh, a lot of people scoff and laugh and ridicule people that are interested in UFOs. And I think before anyone forms an opinion one way or the other, that they should uh, take the time to uh, do a little research on their own. Uh, do a little reading because there is uh, just a, a mountain of information that's available if anyone is is interested enough to to uh, inquire. That was another. That's a sonic boom. They uh, <laughs> they break the sound barrier and they shake us pretty good here sometimes. I noticed that the other day. There was about three right in a row, and it sounded like all these trailers were going to come crashing down. <laughs> sometimes you really think they are. You know, Rachel impresses me as the kind of little town that uh, if you had a bunch of these trucks pull up and hook up to these trailers, it could literally disappear overnight. Well, I, I suppose that could happen, but uh, it couldn't happen without the people's permission, I fear you. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen uh, lights in the distance uh, that where they're not supposed to be, and you see the test site is just right here, and I've seen lights, or no airplanes are allowed to fly over there, not even the military, and I have seen lights over there that uh, I can't account for. What, what have you seen those lights do? Do they just hover? Do they move? What do they do? Well, they're just, the ones that I have seen are just there in, their, in a great distance, and uh, I'm inside the restaurant bar well, just all the times. So I don't really have a lot of time to look. But uh, there have been, uh, like, stars that we have noticed. They'll be there one night, and they won't be there for a week, and then they'll be back again in, in all directions. And they'll move from, from place to place. My wife saw... Uh, well, my wife was telling this one lady about the, the stars that we see that move. And uh, she was skeptical, you know. But they, they spent the night in our motel, and we had closed up, and we were on our way to our, to our room, and my wife walked to the end of the, the people that were, uh, she was talking to were getting some stuff out of a U-Haul truck. So uh, the wife said hi, and we started chatting, and uh, the wife walked over to the end of the building and said, here, uh, I can't remember the lady, that lady's name, so here, here's the star, she was talking to the other lady, so there's that star I was telling you about that moves. So the lady walked over and looked, and just like someone turned on a light bulb, it disappeared. She said, oh my God, it vanished. And that's, that's what happened. It just, uh, it was there and then it wasn't. 
Did you believe in UFOs before you came up here, Joe? Well, I've always, I've always felt that uh, I've kept an open mind about it because anyone that can can uh, have the knowledge that there are trillions of stars in our galaxy alone, and each each uh, star is a sun. Well, I mean that's mind-boggling. And if you think about that, as our solar system is a star, our sun. Well, it would be naive, uh, even. <laughs> even conceded to think that our planet is the only one of these, all these solar systems that support an Earth, a Earth-type planet. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Last summer, there was quite a, quite a little difference. There was an object in the sky that Joe and I had watched quite a few nights when we went home, and it would change, and yet it would still be the same object, it would change positions, directions. I went to show a couple that had been here, particularly, her name was Susan, where their room was going to be, and I said to her about the object in the sky. I said it's going to get brighter, it's going to lower, and it's it's just going to be different. She said, that's Venus. I said, no, Venus is up there, and I showed her where it was, just a, a little bit further up from this object and it was about 10 minutes after 10 that night when Joe and I got to go home and Susan and her husband were outside having to go through the truck to get what she had told me to put by the back door that was in the middle well anyway I got home a little ways past where they were and I called to her because this object was excessively low way down by where the hay fields are and I called to her and she got there and she had just enough time to say oh my god it disappeared and exactly just like that that's how she saw it and it disappeared there was no afterglow there was usually if a light goes out you see something but there was nothing it was just total blank well by now you should have guessed that the secret that we're looking for is what the public generally calls ufos but that's not the only thing that you can find in the Mojave Desert in Nevada. There are many old abandoned, abandoned mines, mine shafts, mining equipment, and a lot of it is dangerous. Be very careful if you come out here and you find these old mines. The shafts can collapse at any moment. In two of the mines, I actually found dynamite that had been left this valley looks like it's empty but just follow the camera and it'll zoom right in on the remnants of an old mining town this whole valley is filled with the ruins of rock homes mines who knows who lived here but as you can see, it's just at the top of Coyote Summit above the little town of Rachel. I found this old ghost town when I was looking for a vantage point from which to view any portion of the test site and to watch the aerobatics of the fighter planes. 110 miles in that direction over those mountains is the little town of Tonopah and the Tonopah test site. I found the ruins of this old mining town so interesting that I almost forgot my original purpose, but I'll show you just some of what I found. Most of the rock walls that made up the dwellings that these men and women lived in were very rough, very primitive. Maybe at one time they looked really nice but you sure can't tell that now. Behind this house was an old grave mound 
the marker long since gone. No way to tell who was buried under that pile of rocks. It's January, as you learned earlier, and there's still snow on the ground, and it's very cold. In some places on the dirt roads where the snow is melting, if you don't have a four-wheel drive vehicle, very likely to get stuck. This is the only building in this little valley that is still mostly intact, although falling down. This was the best rock wall. I soon discovered that I had to be very careful as I walked around these ruins. The ground was deceptive and there are many holes just lightly covered by dirt and old rotten wood. And this is one of them. This, in fact, was someone's dugout home, the remains of an old wooden couch and a cardboard box are all that's left. This spot was extremely dangerous. You can see that there are mine shafts under the ground covered by rotting wood and dirt and all one has to do to disappear forever is just step in the wrong spot. Looking back across the valley it was very hard to leave without walking across and exploring this old building. But realizing the dangers that lie just below the ground, the many tunnels and shafts that these men dug during the years that they looked for whatever they were looking for kept me from doing it. From this side we are on the exact opposite side of the mountain where the observation post is and from this side you can see it much better. You can very clearly see the observation tower at the top of the peak. And now it's time to go down and wait for sunset at the 29 and a half mile marker and see what we can film over the top of the test site. We're standing at the area known as the 29 and a half mile marker by the mailbox on the side of the highway 375 in Nevada. Nobody knew about this spot until I revealed its existence on the Billy Goodman happening KVEG radio show in 1989. Many of the listeners called in and urged Billy to put together a field trip so that they could come out and see if what I had told them was the truth or not. Since then, literally, tens of thousands of people have come out and stood at this spot and watched these strange craft that belong to the United States government fly in the sky over the test site. We're panning the camera in 360 degrees so that you can see what it looks like just after sunset in the desert. There is nothing and no one anywhere near on this cold January night. Most of what you're going to see that we filmed 
during this two-week period was shot from this location and some of it was filmed from a spot right on the boundary of the test site as close as we could possibly get. The tape over the mailbox covers holes that somebody put there with a firearm of some type Very soon it will be dark, below freezing, and no moon. What you're watching is one of the fighter planes streaking across the sky. Training exercises and dogfights are conducted in this area frequently. Every day while I'm asleep, these planes conduct their exercises and I'm awakened on many occasions by sonic booms. If you'll watch closely, coming from the left side of the screen will be another fighter plane, and you can see how good these pilots really are as they literally come head on and meet in midair. That's too close for my comfort. Because I slept all day on most days during the two week period that this documentary was filmed, this was the only example of some of the exercises in the air that we were able to film ourselves. But on many other occasions in my trips to this area, I have seen the stealth fighter, the stealth bomber, this is the stealth bomber. This is the stealth fighter. What you're seeing are official Air Force film clips. This is the SR-71 Blackbird, which was recently retired. This is the B-1 bomber. I have seen the B-1 bomber literally flying approximately a hundred feet above the ground across the Tickaboo Valley. I have seen the stealth fighter, the B-2 bomber, several MiGs, all kinds of uh, the latest fighter aircraft. And you can see all of these things too if you venture out into this area of Nevada. Most people don't realize that the stealth fighter was flying in the late 70s and there was an operational tactical fighter wing made up of stealth fighters by the year 1983. The inhabitants of the Mojave Desert in this area knew about these aircraft many years before the general public even had the slightest hint that they existed. My name is Ron Wilkin. I'm from Reno, Nevada. I worked in a casino as a bartender. I came down this way. Um, I was introduced to Bill Cooper's material from a friend of mine, and we had some videotapes that we had looked at and became curious and um, decided that uh, during my trip to Arkansas, I came down this way and invited a friend along. Got the directions from one of Bill's videos, so I went and bought a World Atlas, which showed exactly where Groom Lake was, along with all of the highways. And uh, when did you arrive? Uh, Monday, uh, I believe it was the twenty-seventh. Okay, and uh, got here in that evening. Uh, we went and got our rooms, and then we came back, and then shortly after we saw um, a spacecraft. 
of a spotting scope, it's a thousand millimeter spotting scope, and set it up and uh, got a good sighting of spacecraft. A mailbox that's uh, known as the uh, 29 and a half mile marker. Um, Who else was there? Uh, a friend of mine, Mike Podesta and uh, Bill Cooper. Can you describe exactly uh, what time it was and uh, what the weather was like? It was a clear sky. It was about uh, 6 o'clock in the evening. Um, it was a, a real clear, kind of cool, um, 30 degrees maybe or so. It uh, got a little unpleasant toward the end of the evening, but uh, about 6 o'clock uh, was the first sighting. Was it dark? Uh, it was pretty dark, um, but that made it easier to see. So what? there wasn't any haze or anything like that. Can you tell us exactly what it was you saw? What did it describe what it looked like? Okay, what it looked like from what I could see was a circular um, object, at least from what I could see it was circular. There was circular lights uh, almost moving in a circular motion. Um, through the scope the first time I had a smaller lens and I could see that it was moving in a very strange direction. So I changed lenses and got a, a much bigger lens, um, which gave me a real good view. Um, and I could see that the object was flying sideways. It would hover. It would go upside down more than once. It would reverse directions, go upside down in the opposite direction. So it, was, it did all kinds of things that I'd never seen before. What kind of uh, lights? Did the, did the craft itself have lights on it, or did it glow? Not on the top part of the surface. It seemed like it was the underneath that did the glowing. Um, the circular lights were really obvious. It was kind of like they were on the edge of the bottom of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, very unusual, and it, it was very easy to see even from a distance with a naked eye. But you know, when you view through a scope, uh, you get a real clear, real clear shot. Did you see any other activity around the area? Any other aircraft or helicopters or anything oh. that you could recognize and compare with what you saw? Oh yeah, there was some some helicopters, and uh, you could see because usually helicopters have like a red light on top and a white light on the bottom, and it flies more or less in a straight line at times and while this spacecraft was flying there was well, some helicopters that were nearby and then there was security kind of below the area where it was flying. Um, later on toward the evening there was uh, some jets and things like that there they were doing some testing so you got a chance to kind of compare you know versus an airplane or jet, a helicopter or anything else. This was completely different. On the first night that we were able to film the craft in the air, I thought it would be important to film some other things that people might think to confuse with what they were seeing. What you first saw was the brightest star in the sky that night, Sirius. What you're looking at now are the headlights of one of the security vehicles approximately eight miles distant from us. You can see the top of the mountain range in the background. It is really very dark. And that is what most people would commonly call a UFO. Through the binoculars, it is actually almost saucer shaped and looks very much like the drawing in the back of my book, in the appendix, my book, Behold a Pale Horse. This vehicle is moving at an unbelievable speed. It is 20 miles away from us and the entire craft glows. Now, let me make that very clear to you. The entire craft glows and pulsates with light. What you're looking at is not an airplane. It is not a rocket. It is not a balloon. In a few moments, you're going to see some very small blinking or strobing lights. 
those lights that you are going to see are aircraft and helicopters that are accompanying this craft on its test flight. This is a very mild test flight. It is not performing the maneuvers that we have seen it perform in the past. However, on another night, we captured this craft performing maneuvers which according to the laws of physics cannot be done. And if they could be done according to the laws of physics as we know them, no human being could live inside a craft performing those maneuvers unless the laws of physics as we know them are wrong. What you are looking at is what people all around the world have been reporting since the late 40s as unidentified flying objects. In my research I have found that Germany actually developed these craft during World War II. Notice just to the right of the craft you can see helicopters and airplanes one of them approaching the craft that large flash that you saw in the background below the mountains was an explosion of some kind that went off in the distance remember this is a military test site they practice bombing runs they do all kinds of things out here they even detonate atomic bombs See how small the airplanes and helicopters are compared to this craft? Remember, we're 20 miles away filming this craft in the air. The horizontal movements, the real rapid ones, are when I'm panning the camera to keep it in the frame. At no time ever do I move the camera vertically. What you are seeing there is the craft making those maneuvers on its own. The only movement of the camera is horizontally to keep the craft in the frame of the video camera. Now the craft did not disappear just then. There you can see it. However, you have to understand that the viewfinder on the video camera is so small, it's about a half inch square that in the pitch black darkness I lost it and I'm now trying frantically to get it back into the viewfinder and there it is. This craft is huge. The entire skin of the craft glows like a light bulb. And it has now completed its test flight. It is going back into the test site at Groom Dry Lake, Area 51. It is not descending into the area known as S4. Don't pay any attention to all the baloney you've heard about that. Well, you saw the brightest star in the sky, Sirius. You also saw the headlights of the security vehicles. These are flares off in the distance. You can always tell flares because they leave smoke trails in the sky. Those of us who served in Vietnam are very familiar with flares. The small strobing white lights that you see diving down toward the flares are aircraft making practice bomb runs approximately 20 miles from our location. We could actually hear the muffled explosions all the distance. You can see now another plane coming in to make his run. Ms. Mike Podesta, I'm from Reno, Nevada. 28 years old, former member of the U.S. Freestyle Ski Team. We just came up to uh, Rachel, Nevada, or Area 51, to check out some things that we could see. We were up here for about three days or three nights, and Monday night, the first night we were out here, we seen some very unusual things. From a distance, at the 29 and a half mile marker, I could see lights, not too uh, distinctive, but looking through uh, Ron's lens, which is like a telephoto or a telescopic lens, I could see a craft and it was, it was very unusual and I was really surprised to see it. When I looked at it, 
it started to do like donut, donut sh shaped circles. And then it started to glow really bright and it started on a trajectory with all these other lights. I assume they were helicopters or planes around it. Um, our cameras froze up. It was very interesting. Uh, it was very cold. And it, the sighting lasted about three minutes. And at about one minute after the, the first craft was moving, another one popped up. And we could see that they were very different, not like an aircraft where it has landing lights. This whole thing was lit up. I've never seen anything like it except for Bill Cooper's video, which shows something very weird. And I would advise anybody, if you're very interested, to come up and check this out. I spent, I took four days off of work, my own money. I'm a concerned citizen. I really want to see for myself, and you can too. Just go out there and look for yourself. It's easy to find, and uh, it's worth your while. Just three minutes of a sighting made my whole trip. Did you have any doubts before you came that, uh, that it might be just a bunch of baloney and maybe you wouldn't see anything at all? No, I didn't. After seeing so many things on, uh, so many photographs and video footage of Bill Cooper's and also some other footage, I knew something's going on, but I really did come down here to see it with my own eyes, and I did, and I was amazed. So you know beyond any shadow of a doubt that they're testing some totally unconventional and unorthodox uh, type of aerial craft in what's called the Groom Dry Lake facility. Definitely. You know, I think of when people say UFO, an identified flying object. Well, it's over a military facility, so I would identify it as a government craft. Definitely doing things that I don't know how any kind of human would survive the maneuvers that this craft was performing. After Monday night, uh, what did you do Tuesday? Tuesday we went hiking uh, about around 4.30, trying to get a better look. It got dark, we came back, there was a sheriff out there, he was kind of harassing us a little bit, not necessarily myself, but Bill Cooper. And uh, we just, we didn't see much Tuesday night. But Wednesday night we went up there, we went in about 11 miles closer, and there was security watching us for about eight hours. Uh, these other guys, they went up and tried to get some photos of the Area 51 Groom Lake, and they did. And we didn't see much, a little bit here and there, not as clear as Monday night, but Monday night was my night. But at one point, I did see something last night. We were all looking at it. And it was traveling like this, and it zipped back the other way and traveled. I don't know if an airplane can do a circle so fast, but it looked like it stopped, reversed, and it did it a couple times. We seen some helicopters, low-flying helicopters, very interesting. We're watching this helicopter flying very low, and it goes just behind a little mountain and it just seemed to disappear. We didn't know if it landed or we never seen it again. That wasn't very far from us, was it? That was about two miles from us, I'd say. From Indianapolis. It's not only cold in the desert, but it's very lonely. I usually take my shortwave radio and listen to Radio Free America whenever it's possible. What you're seeing off in the distance are flares. These are not the UFO type craft. These are not the saucer or disc-shaped craft that people call UFOs. These are flares. Again, if you look closely, you can see the smoke trail above the flares. Remember, you've seen the brightest star in the sky. You've seen headlights. You've seen flares. Later in this video, you'll see the brightest planet. In fact, the only planet we could find in the sky on these dark nights that we were there, moonless, freezing cold, the planet Jupiter. We wanted to make sure that you could see everything that people could possibly say was being confused with this craft that we're filming. This is the planet Jupiter. If you look very closely, you can see two of the moons. We were able to see the moons very clearly 
through the lens. Now Jupiter has many more moons than two, but on this night two were all that we were able to see. Notice it's not moving. Notice that Sirius didn't move, although it did flicker. The headlights moved, but they were below the mountains. This is what we came to film. This is the most incredible flying machine that I have ever seen in my life. You will see this craft on this night make maneuvers that according to the laws of physics are absolutely impossible to make. Now through the binoculars this looks like a metal skinned craft but the entire skin of the craft glows. What you just saw there was not the craft, it was an attempt to bring it into better focus. When you see extremely rapid horizontal movements like that, it is us moving the camera to keep it in the frame. We never move the camera vertically. Never. You just saw the craft do something that we've witnessed on many occasions. It literally disappears from the sky. Through the binoculars, you can see absolutely nothing there. It doesn't turn out lights. It doesn't stop glowing. It disappears. If what we've observed on other trips and on this night is what we think we're observing, then these craft are actually time machines. You see it just come back. It just materializes out of nowhere. And there it's gone again. This is uncut unedited film. It is rolling exactly as we shot it. Now that's us moving to keep the craft in the frame. Remember we never move the camera vertically. Now it's gone again. Through the binoculars it literally disappears from the sky. It is not in this world anymore. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know what to tell you. All I can tell you is what we saw and what we filmed and show you. These maneuvers by these craft have been reported by people all over the world from every walk of life, from every station, from every economic situation, from presidents and leaders and rulers of countries to chief executive officers of large corporations to military personnel officers and enlisted to the man on the street to homeless Primitive tribesmen who have never read a UFO book and have never heard of UFOs have reported these craft. You just saw it disappear. You just saw it blink back on and disappear again. We have no way of knowing where it goes. We cannot explain this. But we can tell you, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that these craft belong to the United States government and are flown from a super secret test site owned and operated by the United States government which the government denies exists. You will also see that test site in this video filmed for the first time from a mountain overlooking the area. This is the only film of its kind ever taken. This is a historic video. This is a historic film. not just this section of the film but the one that you saw previously and the film that you are going to see later in this videotape now if Germany developed this technology during World War II and they've been secretly working on it ever since why is it kept so secret from the public when we know by our research that the United States government 
Great Britain, Canada, and the Soviet Union all possess this technology. Did it come, as many people say, from an extraterrestrial source? I can't answer that question. Those are the donut shaped movements that was explained to you by one of the people that I took along with me. The four people that you see in this videotape had never seen a UFO before in their life and that's why I brought them with me so that you could hear from their own mouth what they saw. Now let me venture a question to you. What better way to unite all humanity in a one world government than if we were attacked by some other species from some other planet. Does this some other species really exist? Or is this technology being used to make us believe that they exist in order to break down the sovereignty of nations and bring all of the people of the world together under one world government. That's a lot to think about and I'm not going to take it any farther than that. At least not in this video. Remember, this film is uncut and unedited. And this is the longest test flight that I have ever witnessed this craft perform. We were also extremely lucky to be able to get this footage because on... Um, me and my husband were invited by Bill Cooper to come up and to view the Area 51 Groom Lake test site. Uh, we came up Monday night. Um, we happened to pass Bill on the 29 and a half mile marker um, going to the little alien and we didn't really realize he was there. Anyway, we got into town and we didn't do anything that night. And the next day we went up to, into the mountain area where we are right before the mountain that you're supposed to climb and it was a little late and um, our two buddies um, Ron and Mike decided to trek off and try to climb the mountain and as it turned out it got too dark and they couldn't see a thing and they were lost for quite a long time and we, me and my husband and Bill were up on the hill and we were watching how the security kept coming back and forth and in and out of the test range area and watching us quite concerned and as it turned out um, some security officer came out and checked out the vehicle and because it, it's, it's the federal land I believe that we were on they called the sheriff and as it turned out the sheriff came out and basically asked us to leave but Bill pretty much stuck up for the whole situation and told us that, you know, told the man that we weren't supposed to leave because this was federal land and we could stay there. So as it turned out, he kind of made up an excuse that we had to move our vehicles away from a watery hole where the cattle come, and um, we got to stay longer. And as it turned out, during this time, Ron and Mike finally find their, found their way up after probably two and a half hours of being out in the desert, and they were freezing and tired and what have you but it was quite an experience, I'm sure, for them. Um, the only thing that I could say that we really seen, besides the security and you know, all the interest they had in us, was um, some sort of illuminated vehicle, whatever it was, coming up over the mountain range that um, kind of like went straight up, right over the mountains, and then stayed there for about a minute and then went, went down again. It was interesting but we're not sure exactly what it was, but it was very, very illuminated. It didn't look like the helicopters or the planes that we had been seeing flying all night. Um, after a while, you get to know that things such as what helicopters look like and what planes look like, then this was quite a bit different. Um, 
Now yesterday, which was Wednesday, we went up oh, in the early afternoon and decided we were going to climb the mountain. Me, we uh, drove our Bronco almost to the base of the mountain and um, went up and walked all the way up to the peak that we were supposed to go to. And what we saw was quite enlightening. Um, we could see a good, good portion of the whole test site, which was a dry lake bed, very, very flat, with all kinds of different buildings, hangars, airplanes. In fact, when we looked down with our binoculars, we could see um, planes clearly in view, large planes. We seen um, a plane come out of there. We seen a helicopter flying around. And the only thing that kind of worried me about the helicopter is it started to fly around in the vicinity of where Bill was and where we were, and we were getting a little paranoid that they were going to come up and basically check out what we were doing. As it seemed that all the security knew that we were there, they were there were probably five to six vehicles during the time we were there going back and forth on the road and slowing down and binoculars out and what have you. So we were really concerned that they might have some problem with us being up there. Well, there they go, off into the desert. While Mike Podesta and I stayed on the hill, Ron, Karen, and Earl took the blazer and followed a little rutted trail for as far as they could, and then made their own trail, blazed a trail, if you will, to the base of a mountain, which we already knew was on the BLM, our public land. Right in the center of your screen, just over those rocks, is their four-wheel drive blazer. They are literally picking their way through the cactus, the rocks, the tumbleweeds. Again, they are just a little below the center of the screen. I do not recommend that anyone who watches this videotape do what we have done. It is extremely dangerous. You can see where we're at. We are literally almost on the boundary of the test site. going to pan around so that you can get some idea of exactly where this section of the documentary was filmed. Down at the lower part of the screen you can see the water hole that the sheriff made us move our vehicles a thousand yards away from in the middle of the night. We won the battle because he told us we had to leave the entire area. You see the road that's going up to the base of the mountain in the distance? That's the dirt road, and where it meets the mountain is Highway 375. 
we're approximately 12 miles from the highway at this point. Again, you can see that there is nothing and no one anywhere around except right over those mountains that you're looking at. It's one of the most super secret test sites in the United States of America. There you can see them approximately in the center of the screen beginning their climb up the mountain. It took them quite a while to reach the top. Again, they're about in the center of the screen. This is a 30 to 1 zoom lens and the heat rising from the desert floor on this warm day, the only warm day that uh, we encountered in the entire two weeks, distorts the image. When we hit the digital and go to 60 to 1, you'll see that the combination of the wind, and it was very, very windy, the wind buffeting the camera and the heat rising from the desert floor seriously deteriorates the camera image. We had a very steady wind on this entire day, and it was almost impossible to keep the camera still even on a very heavy, sturdy, professional tripod. Well, they've reached the top, and the first one who was up there, who's sitting on the rock, was Karen, and she never let the other two live it down for the rest of the time that we were together. Her husband, Earl, was last. I don't envy him at all. Now you can see exactly where they are. From that vantage point, they were able to look right down in and view the entire test site. That's quite a long ways from my position on top of a small hill next to the dirt road that leads into the test site. The actual border of the test site at this point is no farther than three quarter of a mile from our position. While they were up there, and while I was filming them, the black helicopter came out flying very low. They were actually looking down upon the helicopter from their position on top of the mountain. All of them were astonished when they saw the helicopter disappear. From my vantage point, I saw that it did not disappear. It actually flew into an opening in the mountain, which opened up before it as if by magic. I felt as if I were watching some science fiction film as this helicopter flew into the mountain and then the doorway closed back upon it and you could not even tell that it existed. What you're viewing are security vehicles who dogged us the entire time. We were never without our shadow the whole time we were out there. The shadow, of course, was the security personnel. These men work for Wackenhut Corporation. They're under contract to the test site. Most of them are ex-FBI, ex-law enforcement, or ex-intelligence operatives from the many branches of the intelligence community. They are all big in stature, menacing, 
They wear no identifying marks, patches, or insignia whatsoever and will refuse to identify themselves when asked. These two drove up and wrote down the license number of our vehicles. If you do anything wrong, the slightest thing, park your vehicle on a county road. If they run your license plates and find that you have warrants outstanding, anything, they will use the slightest excuse to call the county sheriff to come and either arrest you or order you to leave the area. Your only weapon is to make sure that you do not do anything wrong, make sure you know the laws, make sure that you are on public property, BLM land at all times, and make sure you know what your rights are. These two guys parked out in the desert facing directly at us and watched us and filmed us with cameras and watched through binoculars the entire time that we were on the hill. They were under the impression that we could not see them but they underestimated the power of our telescopic lenses. That will give you some idea of the security. Well, you can see our intrepid climbers coming back down the mountain, and you will hear from one of them now. And we were getting a little paranoid that they were going to come up and basically check out what we were doing as it seemed that all the security knew that we were there they were there were probably five to six vehicles during the time we were there going back and forth on the road and slowing down and binoculars out and what have you so we were really concerned that they might have some problem with us being up there as it turned out the helicopter just flew around for a couple minutes and then I don't know where it went, but it just disappeared, and I don't know where, where it went because it didn't go behind any mountains. The mountains were too low, so I, I'm not too sure what happened to the helicopter, but it was an unusual experience to watch it, and we were very high, and we were way above it, so something happened to it, but don't ask me what. Um, anyway, we got quite a bit of, um, I took some shots with my camera, and Ron took shots with his camera. And I think the only thing we, re we re re get, uh, <coughs> excuse me, regret was we didn't have the proper equipment and possibly like sleeping bags and things like that because I think we definitely would have stayed up there um, all night long and I think we would have came out with some really good footage if we did. The thing is it's, it's a very high peak and you have to basically dress for the occasion and take enough sleeping bags and food and what have you to keep your energy up. Um, I definitely would recommend anybody who knows anything about this to come out and see what's going on because I don't think you'll be disappointed if you spend two to three days here. I mean just the fact that they are so concerned that you're out there is enough reason for me to believe that something goofy is really going on. Um, I have no doubt in my mind that you know they are flying some kind of very, very sophisticated craft. So, you know, I'll be out here again probably in the next couple of months just to get some better footage with a maybe a better camera or video recorder. And I'm going to try my best to get what I can. I well, that um, there definitely is something strange going out there with the government. And I think that if you have any interest in seeing any kind of flying saucer type vehicle, that this is probably the best best place to come. If you stay a few days, you can probably see something. Just um, don't worry too much about the security. As long as you're on the right piece of property, I guess you're going to be all right. I think they try to intimidate you a lot, but um, it doesn't really bother me. I think um, just being out there in the desert and seeing all these unusual things is enough to make me feel that, well, I should take the time and do it and not worry about, you know, what they think. Um, I, I will be out again, so until next time. <laughs> on one of the last nights of my stay, exactly on the boundary of the test site, I watched this craft come up and fly directly over my head. 
the camera was on a tripod and captured this film footage as I watched. I was so surprised by the actions of this craft which made no noise whatsoever that I couldn't even think to pick up the camera and turn it around and follow it across the Tickaboo Valley. It was shaped like a flying wing, what's commonly called a boomerang-shaped craft, made no noise, and had white lights all along the leading edge. Hi, my name is Earl Shepard. I'm from Pickney, Michigan. And I'm here with my wife. I was invited out to Area 51, which is also, <coughs> excuse me, Groom Dry Lake by Bill Cooper. We came out here Monday. Uh, we didn't see anything Monday due to the fact that we were uh, trying to catch up with Bill. But uh, we came out Tuesday, Tuesday evening. Um, it was about 8 o'clock. We were sitting up on a hill area and we were sitting in the truck because it was very cold and uh, I looked out the window and I seen a craft I couldn't identify it or the outline of the craft but it was very brilliant it came up above the mountain range it stopped in midair it moved right slightly and then went back down and I didn't see it after that but I was pretty excited because uh, I don't know of any craft that can actually glow like that. I can understand lights, but these weren't normal lights. I used a uh, 7 by 50 power binocular to look at this craft. Like I said, I couldn't see the outline, but it was very brilliant, like a ball. And uh, that was Tuesday night. It was pretty exciting. Um, also, uh, uh, Tuesday night, we were intimidated by security uh, and also uh, the county sheriff which asked us to leave the mountain area in which we were trying to view uh, unidentified craft or government craft if you will um, that uh, intimidation and harassment lasted 30 40 minutes in which case the sheriff asked us to politely move our cars a thousand feet away from a watering hole which is, I guess, is mandated uh, by the county or something because we're too close and cows can't drink. But uh, that was uh, an interesting evening. Uh, we went Wednesday, uh, Mike, Ron, Bill, myself, and my wife. Wednesday night, uh, we seen something in the air. Uh, it was a craft that was not illuminated. It was metallic. Um, and it moved in strange and erratic patterns uh, that I can't describe of any aircraft, uh, even known government aircraft such as our Air Force uses or commercial aircraft that can move in this manner. Um, the reason or the way I spotted it is I was looking through my binoculars and it kept like twinkling, but it was moving in, a, in an erratic pattern such as it went up, didn't move right, moved left and it spun and then it went down and and through my binoculars the reason I spotted it is because I was out of focus and I made it look like a silver ball and then when I focused in I can see a very little faint light and this light was moving in a horizontal and vertical uh, pattern in which there's no known aircraft that I'm aware of that can move um, we also climbed the mountain. We went on top of the mountain. We looked down in Groom Dry Lake. We seen uh, uh, four military uh, C-130 type aircraft. Uh, we seen jets, helicopters. Uh, we seen hangars. Uh, lots of security out there. Uh, we also seen that they have four very large uh, holding uh, fuel tankers that are behind the hang hangar area. Um, the area is very vast. Uh, is 
very, very large. It's hard to uh, visualize how big the area is, but uh, just given in miles, I, I'd say it's like four or five miles wide. Looking through my binoculars, that's, that's a, an estimate. Uh, while we were up there also, uh, a helicopter came out uh, between the mountains. We don't know where it came from. It came from behind the Groom Lake or at the end of the Groom Lake area. It came out, it circled a couple times. It came towards us, about a mile away from us, and then it flew in, it flew low into a mountain range area and then disappeared. In fact, it was before the mountains. It didn't appear that it went into the Groom Lake area, but it disappeared and never came came back up. And we were kind of scared because we were up on the mountains looking into the test site area. Um, we had we had some pretty good view up there, and we also seen uh, low flying aircraft doing maneuvers. Um, other than that, uh, we really didn't see anything other than the aircraft that I described in the evening. Um, if you're going to go out there, I would strongly advise taking some good winter warm clothing, uh, a compass, uh, some good flashlights. You need to set up some kind of signaling. Uh, within your party so that you know what's going on, uh, emergency signals, uh, and take the proper equipment to be able to view and sight because it does, it gets very cold out there and uh, it can be lonely and boring out there in the desert but make sure you know no one goes off on their own and that because it's so easy to get lost and uh, that's about it. Um, if you go out, don't go out alone. Um, come down to area 29 and a half mile area where the marker, where the mailbox is. Come and view for yourself. Like I said, you know, take somebody with you. Uh, wear warm clothing and stay a few nights. You might not see anything the first night or second night, but come down and see for yourself as I have. Uh, I'm pretty amazed at what I've seen. Uh, really amazing. I'm coming back. I hope you invite me back out here again, Mr. Cooper. This is a satellite photograph of the Groom Dry Lake area. The arrow is pointing to the runway, which is over 35,000 feet in length. You can see the facilities on the upper left quadrant of the screen. This is another historic piece of video footage. The first footage ever taken of the actual installation inside Groom Dry Lake from the top of the mountain, which you saw climbed earlier in this videotape. Here you're seeing an airplane land at the site. This is not one of the saucer-shaped craft. What you're looking at are the landing lights. You can see it very clearly through binoculars. The actual craft that we're talking about, the UFO saucer-shaped type craft, the entire thing glows. The entire flying machine glows like a light bulb. Now it's landed on the runway and it's taxiing up to the facilities. The Army, Navy, and Air Force, and the Marines, and the United States government have denied the existence of this test site for years. However, there have been many slips and leaks. These are two of the expedition that produced this film. The actual video footage was shot by Mr. Charles Wren of Millennium Productions in Los Angeles. You can see that it's a little grainy, but we're very lucky that Charles Wren gave us permission to use this film in this video. And I might remind you that beggars can't be choosers. It's almost sunrise and there's enough light to see the installations. 
very difficult to focus a camera in a very, very small viewfinder in the dim light. That's the road down there that comes from the base of Hancock Summit, Highway 375, all the way into the test site. It's one of our expedition members sleeping on the job. Another one with his binoculars standing lookout. They were hoping to get some footage of the craft in flight from the top of the mountain on this night, but the only thing that flew in the air was the plane that you saw land on the runway. It's hard to make so many trips out here to the test site without falling in love with the desert. I've come to realize that the desert is one of the most beautiful, fascinating geographic landscapes that there is. There you can clearly see the dry lake bed. You can see the runway going across the center of it from left to right. And you can see the hangars and the buildings and facilities. This videotape proves once and for all that when the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, and the Army, and the government deny the existence of this super secret test site and claim that there's nothing there but dry lake bed, that that, in fact, is a lie. The man on the right is Gary Schultz. Later you're going to see a photograph that he took of this craft in the air. We're quite a pair, Gary and I. He has one arm and I have one leg. One more sweep of the horizon. One more peek at the test site. You can clearly see the dirt road that goes into the test site down below the mountain. And off in the distance, the hangars, the facilities, the runway. From the top of the mountain with binoculars or with a telescope, you can see everything quite clearly. This is some type of construction that has marred the landscape and appears to have entrances which go underground. We were unable to identify the exact nature or purpose of that installation. Now, if you follow the dirt road from Highway 375 at the foot of Hancock Summit, this is where you will end up and you must go no further than those signs. This security vehicle was waiting for us like a spider, and as soon as we drove up, they began coming toward us, but they stopped as soon as they saw that I had a video camera on my shoulder. These men who work for Wacken Hut Corporation do not like to be videotaped. They do not like their picture taken. Those are the signs. I would advise you to stay as far away from those signs as I am standing as I make this video. If you cross the line, between those signs, or any line that makes up the boundary of the test site, you are fair game, and could be charged with espionage, could be arrested, and as far as I know, maybe you could be shot. This is the gate of the Medlin Ranch, and here you can see the ranch. There are quite a few trailers on this ranch, and we've watched many of the security vehicles drive up the occupants get out, go into these trailers, and not come out for several hours. We deduce from this 
that the ranch is a front for the security. At night I have driven down the dirt road toward the ranch and a brilliant white light comes on on top of one of these poles and alerts everybody in the valley that someone is on the dirt road. As I said in the beginning of this film, you cannot come anywhere near this test site without coming under the surveillance of someone for the entire time that you are here. This is the bus that takes workers to and from the test site and contrary to what you may have heard and what some hysterical storytellers have said you can clearly see that the bus windows are not blacked out these men who work in this test site and the women who work in the test site know exactly where they work and there is no need to black out the bus windows also while you're out here be careful because all of these vehicles drive very fast down these dirt roads and that's one of the reasons why so the dust cloud doesn't catch up with them many people have asked me after they saw project red light the first film if we had photographed any of these craft in the daytime well here's your answer I can't tell you what it is I can't tell you what it's doing I can't tell you how it's making that trail in the sky all I can tell you is that it is brilliantly lit just like the craft that flies at night it is huge it's approximately 20 miles away this particular craft is moving very slowly however We suspect that they produce some kind of electromagnetic field which literally ionizes the air. Whereas it looks like the entire skin of the craft is glowing, it may be that it is ionizing the air and it is the air that is glowing. Now that's just a supposition. I don't know that to be fact. Now watch what happens here. These things are absolutely incredible. When I was attached to the Office of Naval Intelligence many years ago, I learned that whatever you perceive as the state of the art of any technology in the public sector, that they are at least 50 to 100 years ahead in secret. This videotape should prove to anyone who watches it that science fiction is no longer fiction, it is science fact. if this technology were available to the public sector your guess would be as good as mine this is one of the black helicopters that dogged us while we were making these video films We saw this in the sky, and it probably is a natural phenomenon, but it was just too unusual to go unfilmed. It is a large Roman numeral six. This is what's commonly known as a cigar-shaped craft hovering above the test site in daylight. You can see that it's right under the tip of that white cloud. It is metal through the binoculars. You can clearly see that it is metal. It moves out from under the tip of that white cloud and actually moves sideways into the cloud bank behind it after moving some distance to the left. You will watch it move to the left out from under the small cloud that it's sitting under and then you will see it move away from the camera, directly away from the camera and into the cloud bank behind it. It is a huge metal unconventional type aircraft and that's the only thing that I can tell you about it because it's the only thing that I really know I cannot tell you how these things are propelled I cannot tell you what makes them work I can't even tell you where they really originated from 
but I can tell you that ones that we have filmed out here in the desert belong to and are operated by secret agencies of the United States government and we know from our research that they are also owned and operated by the governments of Canada Great Britain and the Soviet Union what better way to unite all humanity in a one world government than if we were attacked by some other species from some other planet I advise you to think very seriously about that statement this is a photograph that I took of the craft flying over the test site it's a black and white photograph it was taken with a zoom telescopic lens at a great distance on black and white film and blown up this is the photograph that Gary Schultz took of the same object approximately a year before I took my photograph they are exactly the same craft this is a drawing of the craft that you just saw in this video and on those two photographs this drawing was made by a man who works in the secret agencies of the United States government and was able to view this craft in a hangar at Norton Air Force Base this drawing and one of the two photographs you just saw are included in the appendix of my book behold a pale horse